after wishing everyone a good evening, our goal tonight is twofold. Firstly, to try to create a vision of a community that could exist in a theoretical world based on three pillars. As Chazal say, al shlosha dvarim ha'olam omed. The world stands on three pillars. On the pillar of Torah, of Avoda, and Gemilus Chasodim. I'm going to take the phrase Gemilus Chasodim in a loose translation. And it encompasses not just actual chesed, but the entire gamut of sensitivity towards the needs of another person, of another Jew, what we call mitzvahs bein adam lechaver. And if we take these three pillars together and we form a community around them, then perhaps ha'olam omid. Olam here means not just the world in a physical sense, not just the universe, but a Jewish community. And Chazal understood that a Jewish community is a microcosm of the entire world. So we have now a triangle with three parts to it, or a table, if you will, with three legs, Torah, Avoda, and Gemilus Chasod. Together they form a unit. In the Torah, the Hashkafa, the teachings of three giants, that is, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, founder of the Muslim movement, and Rabbi Nassim Sternhartz from Breslov, who gives us insights into so many areas of Torah and previous Torah. And finally, my own Rebbe, Rav Soloveitchik. We have here three individuals that I believe have a tremendous common ground. And in my mind, it's a bit of a chidush to say that they all believe in one common ground. And I try to work very hard to identify, pinpoint what that common ground is. And I came up with a concept called Knesset Yisrael. These three giants were all facing the same problem. And we used the phrase in the past, checklist Judaism. They wanted to create a more profound Knesset Yisrael. That term refers to the entire Jewish community as one entity, each individual with his own unique talents and making his own or her own contribution, unique contribution, but together forming one entity. And my Rebbe used to speak about the 12 stones that formed one large stone under the head of Yaakov Avinu. That was Knesset Yisrael. Yaakov Inu was very afraid during many years and decades of his life when he thought that Yosef was gone. And that would mean that one piece of Knesset Yisrael was taken away and Yaakov had not fulfilled his goal, his mission in life to create an entity, Knesset Yisrael, that had to be made up of 12 different tribes forming one entity. I have here the words of Rav Nassim. He writes that Hamorim, you can come up and take the papers. Hamorim, Matem is pirate. They look at the Jewish people, these are members of the other nations, and they say, What are you so glorious about? What makes you so glorious? Hello, Anamarubim Yosemichem. Our numbers are so much greater than yours. You, the Jewish people, are the smallest of all the nations. And what is our response? It is, al yidei achtus, through unity, shall be Yisrael. B'bchinas mi ki amcha Yisrael goyech advarets. We are goyech ad. We are one indivisible entity, one nation. And therefore, lo yeheba emnegef b'fkodosam. Even if we have to count the people, we count them through the Max Shekel, there won't be any destruction because we are one. 
And Rabbi Nassim goes on to say that when the individual comes in front of the, the judgment, the Kisak cover, and he's failing, he has what we call blemishes and gal, then we quote the Pasuk, the Amech Kulam Tzadikim. What is the word Kulam Tzadikim? It doesn't mean that we were all Tzadikim. It means that as a Kulam, as an entity, each and every one of us, insofar as we're part of this entity, we are tzaddikim, and therefore will be judged favorably. And this emphasis on being sensitive and careful about the individual and his or her sensitivities lies at the very heart, the very essence of Rabbi Yisrael Salanta's Musa movement. What Rabbi Yisrael tried to teach us is that we shouldn't make mistakes. There are common errors in our religious life in which we put all the emphasis on ritual law. And he points out in one of his writings that as far as Natilas Yadayim is concerned, washing our hands before we eat a meal, no one is lacking on that. Everyone's all together as far as eating kashmas. Again, back in the day, today things are a little different. But we're all mocked, we're all very careful not to eat tray for food. But yet, when it comes to business ethics, we seem to be failing. Remember the story about an individual who's a shochet, and he felt the heavy responsibility on his shoulders that maybe he's not slaughtering the animal properly and people are eating trayfus. And therefore, he comes to Rabbi Yisrael and he says, I want to change my occupation. I'm giving up. My, my role is a shofar. So Rabbi Yisrael asks him, so what are you going to do with your life? And he says, I'm going to go into business. Said Rabbi Yisrael, you should know that the laws that govern business ethics, the halachas, the lotas, the essays, are that much more severe than even feeding someone non-kosher food. So this kind of pick and choose in which we think that these laws are more important than these and those mitzvahs for our mother, that's what Rabbi Yisrael was fighting against. All mitzvahs are equally significant. And we should be putting extra emphasis on developing our midos. In one of the pages that you have that says on top of it, Or Yisrael, there's a footnote that's absolutely fascinating. And I want to share it with you. I'm hoping you'll find such a page. Is there? Yes. Or you throw? Yeah. You'll note underneath the line on the bottom is a footnote from Rabbi Yisrael. And he talks about himself. Yotzakti Mayim, the Mori Harav, Rabbi Yosef Zundel. Rabbi Yosef Zundel was the Rebbe of Rabbi Yisrael Salanti. And Rabbi Yisrael says about himself, Ad kan lo higati le He says, I haven't even gotten to his knees. I'm not even on the same level. He can't even put me in the same category as my Rebbe. And now he describes his Rebbe in a few lines in a very fascinating way. Hu sulam mutzav artsin. He's like a ladder, like remember Jacob's ladder in his dream, that is situated, grounded, on the earth, on the Artsa. What does that mean? In the Nimshal, it means Torud Berayone Amishcha. His Rebbe was a businessman. His feet were on the ground. He was constantly preoccupied with thoughts about how to make his business successful. Levakesh Tarfam, so that he could bring some funds and sustain his family. He classifies his Rebbe, listen to this, as a Balabas. But for Rosh Hashanah, but where's the head of the ladder? It's all the way up in heaven. If you think that he's carrying a heavy burden of Tirta with regard to Mishkai, his work, his preoccupation, that's nothing compared to the heavy burden that he carries himself on his shoulders for for the life of his soul. 
and he talks a little bit about the study program of his Rebbe. Imagine, his Rebbe is heavily involved in business in order to eke out a living. But Lomed Gemara, the Chule, Chule means etc. It means Gemara, Poskim, Beis Yosef, Kol Hachron and Be'ilim. Look at that word, Be'ilim. Each one of these sources, he studies in depth. And especially the Bir Hagra, he puts extra effort to try to unravel the, mis- the mysteries of the Bir Hagra, a commentary the Vilna Gaon on Shulchan Aruch. When he studies one paragraph, one law in the Shulchan Aruch with all its commentaries, he has the entire picture clearly in front of his eyes. As if somebody is coming to ask him a question, and he is going to look at this picture that's in the apple of his mind in order to, in order to answer the question. And he goes into great depth until he finally can determine the Psach Halacha, the final decision. The Uz and then Chosil from Rabos, he goes over it and over it until he has it in his back pocket. And then he learns Tanakh. Interesting. Kol Libuda Tanakh, Ubu Gemara, Ubu Midrashim, Vizar, Yisod Lechapes Yediyas HaMaisa, I'll call Ela Hayigia. Imagine an individual who is on such a level of Torah knowledge that he integrates all of Tanakh, all of Chas, all of Poskin, and the Ian Godel, so that he sees the whole picture and he has it in his back pocket and he's working on sit, giving answers and handing down decisions on any question that might come up and he's constantly reviewing it. And this is a man whose the feet of his ladder are situated deeper on the earth because he's involved in Mishar, Kovim This, I believe, is Rabbi Yisrael Salanta's vision of a Jewish community. A Jewish community that's made up of Balabatim. Again, that's the term he uses to describe his Rebbe. A Balabatim who are working with occupations, bringing home a living, a livelihood. And yet, look how steep they are in the study of Torah. And always trying to discover their own midos, how they can be more sensitive, how they can be more careful and meticulous about the laws of business, of choshen mishpat, an area of halacha, a wing of the shulchan that is highly ignored. And I ask a historical question here tonight. Was Rabbi Yisrael successful? Did he actually live up to his ideal and create such a community. And here, when we want to evaluate the legacy of Rabbi Yisrael, we have to really subdivide it into two categories. As far as Balabatim is concerned, in his time period, they were so involved in trying to eke out a living, they didn't have the mind to focus on all these other areas of Libera Torah, of Tikkun Aminos. However, he sent two of his great Talmudim, the Altar of Slabodka and Rav Isil of Blazer, and we'll talk in a minute about the Altar of Kelim, that was a special category, but these were the students of Rabbi Yisrael who were successful in bringing the Musa movement into the yeshiva world. And to this day, that tradition of setting aside time in the daily discipline, the daily schedule of Torah study for Musa and the Svarim of Musa, the Limar Musa, is still very much in vogue in the yeshiva world. That's where Rabbi Yisrael had his most, his greatest success. And if I ask the question, what happened in one particular Lithuanian town called Kelm? One of Rabbi Yisrael's great students, 
the altar of Kelm came into this city and he addressed the Balabat. It wasn't his job to try to make in, inroads into the yeshiva world. He was trying to create a community of Balabat who would be living the life of Muslim. And he was successful to a great extent. The people in Kelm were known to live on a higher level in terms of their sensitivities, I'll give you one small example. You may laugh at this and consider it insignificant, but in its time, it was greatly significant. In Kelm, in the marketplace, people got very excited and sometimes they would curse each other. This is what went on. I think it's probably true even today. But in Kelm, there was no such thing. There was never an altercation which led up to a curse to a clone. This is one example of the impact of the altar of Kelm on the city of Kelm. And here we're talking about the impact on Balabatu, on people who are dedicated to work, to occupation, and to eke out a living. There's a famous story about a certain town in Lita. I don't know if you've heard about a period in Jewish history called the Kanvanistim. What it was, the Russian government was conscripting young Jewish men to the Russian army. And it could mean 25 years in the army. No Yiddishkeit, no shuls, no kosher food, no nothing. It was horrible. And the word got back to Rabbi Yisrael that in a certain town, the rich people in that town did not have any of their sons in the army. What happened? They would bribe with their wealth the officials. And what they were able to do was they were able to take the son of a poor family and substitute him for their sons. Do you follow? So you have rich people. Each one had a name, and Rabbi Saul knew all of them by name. And they would, mafioso style, I would use the term, they would grab young men who are wealth from poor families and send them to replace their sons because they ransomed their sons by paying bribery with their wealth. And Rabbi Saul said, I'm coming for Shabbos to this town. Rabbi Saul came to this town for Shabbos. They made a gala kiddush in his honor. And at the kiddush, he calls up one by one each one of the wealthy people. And he says, I know what your machmir, or I know what your strictness is. This one was very strict about the laws of ribbons. This one was strict about shmura matzah. One was strict about Erev and he wouldn't carry in the town because he didn't trust the Erev. Each one had his own chumrah. And he bombasted them. He said, oh, you want to have your own stricture, your own chumrah. But what about the Isa do Raisa, the Torah prohibition of Gonev Ichu Lecharo, when you're stealing someone? And by the end of Shabbos, each one of these wealthy Balabatim, oh, this is how you do it, each one of these wealthy Balabatim would give up on that position that he had, he had secured with money, with wealth, and everything was straightened out. I mean, this was the impact of Rabbi Yisrael because he knew each one's chumras. And he could say, oh, yeah, you're machmer in this. That's your stricture. What Rabbi Yisrael tried to create was a society of er honest people, people who were straight, people who took the laws of monetary realm, the monetary realm, very seriously. But what he found was that he was fighting an uphill battle. So what is Musa today in our contemporary society? And I have to tell you this. To study Rabbi Yisrael Salanta's work, we'll call him his magnum, magnum opus, this Ari Yisrael, one page of which you have, is very difficult, almost impossible. The language is very heavy, very terse. It comes from a different society. So where is the modern world of Musa? Where is Musa in contemporary life? 
So there are many examples I could give. There's a book called Climbing Jacob's Ladder. There's a book by Rabbi Solomon, the Mashkiach of Lakewood. But I would like to focus your attention, and I photocopy one page for you, from a book called Ale Shah, from Shlomo Volpe, who passed away not long ago. He instituted in the city of Yerushalayim, in our time, that which Rabbi Yisrael was striving for. And that's called the base of Muslim. He had a house that was dedicated to the study of Muslim. But it wasn't the Musr of the old time. And as you'll see in this page, in this page, which is called Hevdel Adorot, he speaks about the different generations. And he points out that the Musr, at the time of Rabbi Yisrael, in the Musr movement initially, would not cut the mustard in our contemporary life. The Musr was heavy tochacha. And today our young people cannot tolerate this heavy kind of tochacha. We have to focus on the greatness of man. We have to emphasize the Milo, the superior nature of men, the qualities they could strive for, the glorious, lofty character traits. And if we instill in our students and in our sons and daughters this love for those ideals, then they will live up to that level and they'll be inspired. In one of the pages that I gave you, there's a short paragraph from the Altar of Slavodka. It's called Chesed Shel Torah. I don't want to spend the time looking for it, but it's in amongst these pages. And what the Altar of Slavodka points out is that our concept of Chesed in the world of Musa, of Jewish ethics, is radically different, fundamentally different than the work, than the concept of ethics in the secular world. In a secular world, someone who spends a lot of money to help the poor, he's considered on the highest level. We bow down to him. He's the Ish Chesed. He's the great manifestation of Chesed and goodness. No, 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 no. Chesed, from a Torah perspective, says the Alpha, means appreciating the greatness of man, realizing and acknowledging that man is as David Amalek puts it until him. We are a little bit lower than the Almighty. What does that mean? Man is created with its Selim Elohim. He's, so to speak, a chelik elokami mal. He is part of the divinity. No matter what you do for him, it's never going to be enough. And he quotes the Psikta, which I mentioned a few weeks ago. I am lachta es So the first leg of of the community that we're talking about in our vision is the leg of Gemilus Chassad, focused on sensitivity. I'll give you one example. Hachnosas Archim. I don't know if you've ever had an, an experience where you ended up somewhere and you needed a host. You needed someone to take you in and there was no one there. It's a horrible experience of loneliness of feeling ignored, of feeling alone in this world. But Achnosis often means, as we saw from Avram Avinu, to go out actively and seek out guests. Look and see who needs a place. And not only that, but Avram Avinu does everything. He stands head and foot over the guests because no matter what you do, on behalf of these Selevel Kim, it's never going to be enough. The sky's the limit and beyond. When Adam Arishal was first created, the Medrash tells us that Malachi Ashores felt that he was a godly being and they wanted to bring sacrifices to him. That's how great man is. Man is an angel that fell from Shemayim. The sensitivity that we need. Of course, bad midos, like Kas getting angry, jealousy, there's no room for that. But we have to work on that. And what Rav Volpe points out in his article here about our Doros, our contemporary generations, is that at the very least, we have to make our students aware of these great milos, of these great character traits of honesty and being straight and being sensitive and caring for the next one. How can I help the next one? 
And even if we don't rebuke our people, we don't criticize them and put them down on the country, we build them up, but nevertheless, by exposing them and having them study on a regular basis these great lofty character traits, they'll have something to strive for. And this is what I believe is contemporary Musa. This is the community that Rabbi Yisrael would have us create in our time. So again, just to repeat, our opening line tonight is that we're trying to create a triangle made of three elements. One element we spoke about is Gemilas Chassod. Now let's go on to another element. And that is Torah. Torah, I believe, is the great contribution again, of all of Gedol Yisrael, but I'm going to focus on my Rebbe of Soloveitchik, the emphasis on Havana Torah, on delving deep into the Torah, not to learn the Torah superficially, to constantly ask questions and analyze, to classify and define concepts as precise as you possibly can. And we saw in our Rebbe an unbelievable Hasmada, what I mean by Hasmada, is a dedication. When he went home at the end of the class, it wasn't like closing the book and I'll be back tomorrow for the next lesson. It was let's study it over and over again, in depth, with a critical eye. And in the ethics of Rav Soloveitchik, we translate metaphysical ideas into reality, into practical considerations and demands. For example, God created the universe. Yesh me'ayin. We have to imitate God. We also have to be creative. And we have to use all of our energies to be creative. And especially in Torah learning. But that element of creativity goes beyond. We mentioned once in the past, maybe you recall, that according to Rabbi Avo, the Medrash, God created many worlds. He was not satisfied with these worlds. We have to imitate God. And we have to realize that sometimes we put in all this effort and we build something and we create something, but yet it falls apart. It collapses in front of our eyes. Rabbi Akiva lost 24,000 students, but yet he got up, cleaned the dust off his, of, his, of his cloak, so to speak, and began all over again from scratch, five new students. So something went wrong and something failed. But I go back and I recreate endlessly with dedication. The concept of creation is metaphysical. We can't understand Yesh, Mayan, Ex, Nihilo, but what we learn from this is that God is the owner of the universe. God possesses all. This is the great foundation of ethics. Everything I have in life. All of my talents, all of my abilities, all of my energies, they belong to him with a capital H. He created the world and he owns the world. It all belongs to him. And now I'd like to move on to the third leg on which our Olam is standing. And that is Avodah. And here we get Rab Nassan, the great Rab Nassan, who today was his yard site on Asura B'Teves, he built for us a world of Avodah. Talk about the subjects and the themes. It's just almost endless. His magnum opus is called Likute Allah, that's made up of eight volumes. But beyond that, he wrote many, many other works. On tefillah, on prayer, he wrote an entire work, which is called Likute Tefillos. Our son in, 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 uh, up in Carmiel has begun to recite some of those tefillos. had nothing to do with me on his own. And he says they're incredible. They're wonderful. These are of Nussan's tefillos that he authored, that he created. He built a world about not only tefillah, but simcha. The antithesis, the enemy of everything that we do is atzvus, is when we feel down. That brings us to a state of melancholy, of darkness. And what could defeat all these powers? It's got to be simcha, a realization that we are the creation of our Kodesh Baruch We are the Tzalem Elokim. 
to appreciate the incredible, endless good and benevolence that God bestowed upon us. And most important is his karavus Lashem, to build a community where the emphasis is on going, getting closer and closer to Hashem. One of the main concepts in Rabbi Nossin's writings, and it comes from his Rebbe, Rabbi Nachman, is tikkun abris. What is tikkun abris? Of course, we know there's a bris milo, but it goes way beyond the bris milo. We're talking about a bris, a bris, as brischa tishmoru means a covenant between man and Almighty God. In the context of that covenant, man makes an absolute commitment that all of his focus is on getting closer and closer to Hashem to fulfill God's will. Whenever we get sidetracked by passions and lusts and desires, whether it's in this area or that area, that is a pagam, that is a blemish in the bris, because the bris is an all-inclusive slicha, is an all-inclusive commitment. And therefore, he builds an entire world around how we can battle against these forces that try to trip us down. His thesis is that whenever we try and succeed in getting a little bit higher and we ascend the ladder and come closer to God, at that point, we are automatically in a situation where we will be tested with impediments and barriers and darkness and confusion. And all this is part of a divine plan for our benefit so that we can climb even higher and higher up that ladder. So that when it comes to the realm of avoda, of service of the Almighty, we have so much to learn from Rabbi Nassim. And that, I believe, is the third leg of our table that we spoke about before, the Gimel in Sodos Shaol Bonim. I want to talk to you a little bit about what I think is unique in the contribution of Rav Soloveitchik in terms of creating a community. I will mention the following concepts. Number one, contemporary life. Number two, the state of Israel and Zionism. Number three, attitudes towards non-Jews. Number four, attitude towards secular studies. And number five, the place and the role of a woman. These are contemporary issues that Rav Soloveitchik, more than any of the other giants, addressed these issues. He was not embarrassed. He took on a host of contemporary issues, not the least of which is the attitude that we have towards the Zionist entity. And please note that in his upbringing, whether it is in his father's house or his grandfather's house, the emphasis was not on Zionism. Zionism was not on the agenda at all. He came from what we call an Aguna background. Well, how did it happen? What happened? Rav Soloveitchik gave a lecture in which he describes why he jumped ship, so to speak. The entire lecture is built around the machlokas between Yosef and his brothers. Are you familiar with this? How many people in the room have heard about this? No, nobody? What was the machlokas between Yosef and his brothers? Yosef understood, based on the revelation of God to Abraham at the Brisbane of Basarm, Geri Yezarach of Eretz Lohem, that we are at a very critical turning point in history, in Jewish history, and we've got to prepare for that turning point. We are about to enter into the exile, and the good old ways that we're familiar with from the others, from Avram, Yisuk, and Yaakov, that's not going to be enough. That's not going to do it for us. Those traditional modes of behavior and the kind of work that we do, we have to prepare for a radical change. If we're not prepared, then the exile in Mitzrayim could, heaven forbid, bring us totally down. And the brothers rejected. They were not willing to accept the revolutionary ideas of Yosef. They felt, let's leave well enough alone. This is the tradition, and we've been building based on our avos, and we're doing fine. We're living a religious life. We're living in Eretz Canaan. Right now, we're fine. You worried about the exile? You know, we'll face that difficulty when it comes around the bend. 
at the end of the day, despite the fact that it was Yosef against all his brothers in this controversy, Hashgacha, divine providence, Paskin like Yosef, that means that they were on the verge of entering into the exile, into Eras Aretz, Eras Mitzrayim, and they had to be prepared for this. And Rav Salvechik said that in a similar way, there was a controversy between Zionism and the traditional Jewish approach based on the Avos, based on thousands of years of tradition. And the Zionist movement said, we have to prepare for a whole new existence to establish a state that will protect the well-being and the welfare of the Jewish people, the refugees. And Rav Soloveitchik said that he was brought up with the traditionalist approach, but what he saw in his lifetime, in the 40s and especially in the 50s, is that Ashkoch of asking like Yosef, asking in favor of the establishment of the state. What is our attitude towards non-Jews? If you take a look at a page, again, I'm hoping that you'll find it. It's called Reflections of the Rug. Yeah, please, Mary. Whatever, like the the he didn't talk in that like the Zionist, but because he saw the need for the Jewish people for the state of Israel, like he lived through the period of the Holocaust. Again, he was not in the Holocaust, and he was willing to go against exactly background. And he lost sleepless nights. I mean, they they I can't begin to tell you how much opposition he. He, he faced why, from his own family why, members. Why do they see the opposition? Didn't they see the obvious need for a place? That's a different people? question. I don't know. For that, we need another hour. But I'm just telling you where our salvation was coming from in his attitude towards Zionism. And in this essay, again, you're only looking <laughs> at part of it, is Rav Salvation's attitude towards the non Jewish population. What is the Jewish attitude towards non Jews? in contemporary life. And it's not something that was addressed neither by Rabbi Yisrael nor by Rabbi Nassim. And he bases himself on a pasuk that Avram Avinu says, Ger v'toshav anochi machem. On the one hand, I'm a ger, I'm a foreigner, but I'm also a toshav, I'm a member, I'm a citizen. How could it be both at the same time? And in typical style, Rav Salvechik has what you call a dialectic. There's a thesis, an antithesis. And he writes, on the one hand, as a citizen, the Jew assumes the social and political obligation to contribute to the general welfare, to combat diseases, famine, corruption, foreign enemies. And yet, on the bottom paragraph on the left side, page 170, the Jew has another identity which he does not share with the balance of mankind. And that is, we are part of a covenantal community. We are part of a bris with our Kodesh Baruch who established at our Sinai over 3,000 years ago. And this gives us a unique identity of a ger. Ger being we're separated from the nations. So we're really in this kind of tension, which he talks about here on page 171, an inevitable tension in trying to uphold these two polar ideas that seem to be mutually exclusive. On the one hand, we're Gerim, and we have allegiance to our own covenantal community. But on the other hand, we are members of society, and we take the welfare of reality very seriously in order to care about the welfare of the people around us. And then he goes on in the balance of this essay, which we don't have time for tonight, and he speaks about at what point is there such a deviation when the nations of the world around us will be immoral and in intolerant, and especially the Jew, at that point, we are no longer Aaron. We are no longer part of the community, and we break away. But until that point, we should give thanks to the, to the Rebona Shalom for being in a society that is pluralistic, that's based on freedom, and identifies the freedom of every individual. And not only that, he says we should even celebrate, as I mentioned to you last week, Thanksgiving. He was a real patriot of something. And talk about the role 
of the Jewish woman. Once again, as we said before, a woman is not obligated in the midst of Talmud Torah the way a man is. Again, actually, she has so many obligations in Talmud Torah in any event. But Rav Salvechik put the emphasis even on those areas where clearly a woman is exempt from Talmud Torah. Yet, if on her own initiative, she wants to study Torah, she's motivated and moved and inspired, and she takes it seriously, then we should afford the women with all the possibilities that they can have. And what about secular knowledge? Now, here I have to tell you, Rav Soloveitchik was very extreme in favor of secular knowledge. And I hope I won't get flack for saying this publicly, but if you were a family member and you didn't go to Harvard, no good. No good. You had to go to Harvard. It wasn't just enough to go to city college, you know what I'm saying? You have to have the highest level of secular education. And Rav Salvation put a lot of emphasis on the study of mathematics. That was like top on the totem pole because he felt that mathematics would train your mind how to analyze and think. So that when his son in law, Rav Aaron Lichtenstein's of finally finished his PhD in English literature, so the Rav, and he came to his father-in-law, you know, expecting the Rav to say, wow, you got a PhD from Harvard. And the Rav immediately said to him, now will you study math? <laughs> but philosophy, as you know, the Rav himself was so steeped in philosophy, one footnote in his halachic man, a lonely man of faith, would take us months to analyze. He knew it all. And when he came to class in the University of Berlin, he studied properly. He was in classes with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. He never understood. The Lubavitcher Rebbe came in with piles and piles of sperm. And yet he got A's on all his exams. He says, for me, he said about himself, Rebbe Salvation, I had to listen to every word that came out of the professor's mouth. I couldn't be steeped in learning and get an A on the exam. In any event, he wrote his PhD thesis on Herman Cohen. There's a room, I don't know if it's uh, ever been substantiated that he wanted to write his thesis on Plato and try to show that there's a relationship between the Ramam and Plato in that theory. In any event, all of this secular knowledge became very important. The Gaon, the Vilna Gaon, uh, is, is assumed, I don't know if it's ever been proven to have said, that if you're missing secular knowledge in the seven branches of Chachma, of, of wisdom, then you're missing in your Torah knowledge. You must have that wisdom in order to understand and analyze Torah on the deepest level. Unbelievable integration of both Torah knowledge and Lahabdil secular knowledge, all integrated into one. But I have to tell you what the critics say about Rav Salvechik in a number of these points. They claim that Rav Salvechik is describing an ideal, a very lofty, high level that very, very few people can achieve. And this created a whole raucous about co-education, you know, boys and girls studying together in class. And in the high school that Rav Salvechik and more, more his wife, his Revinson, created the Maimani School in, in Boston, the, the men and the women would learn Gemara together in class. And the critics said, no, Rav Salvechik was not in favor of this, but there weren't enough funds to create two schools and have classes that were separate. This is a, a, a machlokis that's going to go on and on. Until, until Mashiach comes. What I'd like to discuss with you now, and I may be jumping a little bit ahead of myself, but I have so much to say to you tonight, is that I believe that although we have these three legs, the Shlosha Amudim, Sha'olam Omed Alem, and they integrate because there's so much in common. And the differences seem secondary. It's all a question of where you put the emphasis. So Rav Salvechik would put the emphasis on Havana Satorah, and Rav Nassim of Breslin would put the emphasis on Primia Satorah, and Rav Yisrael Salanta on Mido Satorah. But I think it's not just an issue of priorities and where to put the emphasis. And in the last couple of weeks, as this series has developed, I have organized myself 
a list of approximately seven different major issues of contention here in our tripod, as we call it. Number one, the relationship between Olam Hazer and Olam Abba, this world and the next. From the perspective of Rav Salvation, and I would assume Rav Yisrael Salanter as well, all of our emphasis, all our eggs are in one basket. Which world? This world. Olam Hazer. Forget about Olam Abba. That's not your issue. As the Mishnah tells us in Avos, <coughs> Don't be an Evan Amishamish is Rabbi Omanaskab. Don't think about Olam Abba. Yafa Shahachas Bol Mazemi Kol Chay Olam Abba. One hour. The Vilna Goen at the end of his life was holding on to his tzitzis. And he was yelling and declaring, In this world, in one moment, I can be Makayim the mitzvah of tzitzis, which is Shakul Kenegid Tariq mitzvah. And all this is going to be over. All this is going to be gone. Someone who passes away is called Potter in our mitzvahs. All of our emphasis is on embracing this world and bringing the divine being down into this world and thereby elevating this world. But when you read the works of Rabbi Nassim, you get an entirely different perspective. This world is nothing more than a prose door. It's a, an antechamber. It's only a means to an end. And the real true existence that we prepare ourselves for in this existence is all of our book, all our emphasis and all our beliefs and all our prayers. The first thing you should say when you wake up in the morning, you don't have to say it, you think it, is there's a world to come, a world of infinity, of eternity. That should be the first thought when I wake up and I open my eyes in the morning, even before I recite Modani. Because the entire focus of my life is all for the world to come, the world of ain't so, of infinity. And this, I believe, generated a second point of contention, the attitude towards death. In the writings of Rav Soloveitchik, death is the absolute curse, the enemy of man. There's no greater curse than death. Death is tumor. Death is contamination. A corpse contaminates. A coin is not allowed to go in or have any connection to a, to a mess. We are not allowed to contaminate ourselves. And Rav Salvechik and Allah man pointed out that his grandfather of Chaim would not visit cemeteries unless he absolutely had to in order to bury the dead. And then you open up the works of Rabbi Nassim and what a world of a difference. The essence of man is a combination of goof and the shama, the physical body of man together with the spirit of man. That neshama comes from a very high place. Its origin is in the Almighty. But it was brought down to this earth. And it's constantly desiring to separate itself from this earth. The goof, the body, incarcerates the neshama, it brings it down. Death is a blessing. The passage from life to death is not something that should frighten us. Obviously, we want to live as long as we can in order to achieve whatever we can possibly achieve in the will of God, but not to be afraid of death, not to contaminate death, but rather to realize, he quotes a Medrash, Rabbi Meir says, Tov Ma'od Zambisa. Could you imagine saying that death tov ma'od? A whole other perspective. Another area of contention. Limud ha Musa, the study of Musa. I have here amongst the pages that I photocopied to you a page that looks like this. It says Likute Alochas. And if you look on the left column, this is in Hilta Shabbos, Rabbi Nassan writes. He says, The study of Musa books is 
אבל אף על פי כן אין מבוארים שם כל כך עצוס טובוס לעבודוסו. This is a tremendous פרשס דרוכים, a parting of ways between רבי ישראל סלנטו on the one hand and רבי נוסן אוגרסיב on the other. Whereas Rabbi Yisrael and his Talmidim, till this very day, we mentioned Ali Shor before, are advocates of introducing into the study, the daily discipline of Torah study, reading the books of Musar. Rabbi Nasan has a different priority, which he calls Eitzah. Eitzah means good counsel. What the generation needs, and every generation is, bestow, is bestowed with its tzaddik, is that the tzaddik will teach us etzos, how to live our lives. All of the works of Rabbi Nassim are all about how to live our life. I mentioned earlier, you know, we're on our way up and we reach a high and then we start falling down and then we pick ourselves up again and we have to have etzos, we have to have counsel and wisdom and recommendations as to how to face all these challenges and not to let them get her down because as we said before, the adversity and the, and the evil is all in Atzvus. And Simcha is the answer to everything. Again, my friends, don't think that when I say Simcha, I mean you have to jump on top of trucks. I don't, I don't know about that. You know, that, if you want to do that, that's fine. It's your, your thing and that's your thing. That's not what we're talking about. Simcha is an inner state of being It's a constant awareness of the great chesed that God bestowed upon us. When we recite modim every morning, three times a day in tefillah, you know what Nisim and Eflos of Nassim says he has, we have in mind? The fact that God doesn't reject us despite the pagamim. And no matter how low a person reaches, God is still there. And God beckons to that person and listens to every move and might possibly inspire that person. So it's all about Eitzos. And we could read the Sifrei Musar, and it might have an impact on us, and it might inspire us, but it won't give us Eitzos. And that's what this whole Torah is all about. Rav Salvation himself is also opposed, initially at least, to the study of Musar. He felt that when Rabbi Yisrael introduced Musar, it was a movement that brought to melancholy. You remember the Moshe, There are times, David, if you feed castor oil to someone who's healthy, he's going to surely get sick. We're healthy. We don't need Musar. But in one of the paragraphs, which I gave you to read here in the photocopy pages, again, I should have kept one for myself. But anyway, hopefully you'll find it. Oh, yeah, it should have a circle and a nine on top of you. If you find such a page on the right side, Ish Halakha, you see it the right side on the second half of the page, This is what we call Slabodka. Have, have you heard of Slabodka? No, the name of the work is called Ish Halacha, Halachic Man. Own pen. Writing about. Well, no, no, no. This is an essay of 150 pages out of which I, I, I'm cutting out five lines. I have an essay that covers a wealth of information. But in five lines, he addresses the objection of Reb Chaim to Musar. As I said before, because Musar brought a state of melancholy, he used to close the lights, child should his time and berate themselves and so forth and so on. I'm not going to go into detail. But here, Rav Salvechik is saying that if we want an honest to goodness contemporary attitude towards Musser, things have changed. Musser has taken on a whole different shape under the influence of Rav Nota Finkel, like the Alto of Slavodka, who be Shivas Mir, under the influence of Rav Yerucham Lubavitz. I mean, to read their works would be an amazing achievement on our part. And if we would combine that with reading the great Muslim works of Rav Shlomo Volpam, he has works, Vadim, Bar Hassanim, and Kalas, I mean, real practical stuff in a contemporary life in Ali Shore. And you'll see the English translation on the left side if you're interested. And then a piece from the Alta Slavodka about the greatness of man. No matter what we do for him, it's never, never enough. 
So here we have a little bit of a bone of contention about the study of Musa, whether it should be introduced as part of the curriculum. And now I get to another issue when I've been working on this. I can't get my head off. That's Tfilo. You may have photocopies of the Urim Lezecha Bamari. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm so apologetic here because I, I'm not organized and I, I, I put out all these pages on the table without leaving myself any pages. But hopefully you'll find a page that either says Urim Lezecha Bamari on top or... Oh, thank you so much. Here, it, it should say Mem Aleph on the bottom. There may be another sequel to this. I don't know if, if it made it here or didn't make it here. And David, does it say Shirim Lezeich Rabbi on top? No, Binyan Smichut Kula Oh, Binyan Kula That's one essay in a book called Shirim Lezeich. These are the yard side Shirim from Gimel Shvat. And the Rav develops a sugya in Mesechta Vodazara. And the Gemara quotes a three-way machlokas about when a person is allowed to ask what's called makoshas tzrachav, right? I have my own personal needs, and I want to supp- I want to supplicate God, and I want to somehow pray on my own behalf for those particular unique individual needs. And there are three sheets about how to do this. According to one Tana, you have to do it before Shmon Esrei. According to another Tana, you do it after Shmon Esrei. And according to third time, you injected it to Shmach Olenu in the middle of Shmones. And the Rav is wondering, it's a sugyan of Odezor outside. Nobody says anything about this, Gemara. Somehow it got lost in the shuffle. What's it all about? Well, when they're racking their brains, Tanoim, about where to, it, where to inject my own supplications. And the Rav said, because who is man? Mortal man, physical, made of flesh and blood. You lose Isha. He's here today and God tomorrow. And he's going to stand in front of the Melech Malchi Amloch, the King of Kings, with his own personal supplications? Who are you? Mi Samcha. What license do you have? And according to one time, if you attach it to Shmon Esim, which is established as a formal standard prayer by the Anshi Knesset then it gets swept in. It's almost as if the King of Kings has opened the door a crack when you're ready for Shmon Esri because Anshi Knesset established Shmon Esri. Now you can inject your own personal supplications. The second man Yomer says, no, you have to do it within the framework of Shmon Esri. You have to inject it in that bracha where it's appropriate or in the Padpori, the general bracha, the fallback bracha, which is called Shema Koledu. And the third sheet that says, no, you can't touch the framework of Shmon Esri the way it was formulated, formulated by Chazal. You're allowed to add your supplication at the end of Shmon Esri. And the Gemara tells us in brachos how each uh, Amora used to add his own tefillah. We have a little kind of song. I don't know how to reconcile this with Rav Nossin. In the philosophy of Rav Nossin, it's on every other page. Is something called his bodhinus. There have been children's books written about his bodhinus. His bodhinus means, can you talk to God? Can you pour your heart out to God? So you tell a litva about his bodhus, the first thing he says to you is, I don't know what to say to God. That's the problem. What's your relationship like with God if you don't know what to say to him? Where is your friendship with God? Where is your dependence on God, your closeness? All of our vodas is about getting close to the God. And you can't say words to the Rebona Shalom. You can't find the words. So again, whether it means that you have to go out to the fields, you know, but find a private moment. And I, I don't know if you can commensurate with my pain because I don't know how to reconcile these two mutually exclusive approaches to tefillah. According to our salvation, it's all about the formal tefillah that was standardized and formulated by the Ajik Nesek And from the perspective of Rabbi Nasson, whose yard side, as I said before, was today, the emphasis here is on your personal supplications, your personal prayers. Shake the heavens. Of course, you have to read the standard prayer and prayers. We are absolutely committed to the, Shmona, to the Shulchan Aruch, 
the Lakuti Allah is a work on children of cover to cover. But where's the emphasis? Where's the ultimate prayer? The ultimate prayer is your prayer when you communicate with God. And I came up with the following thesis. You'll be my Jew. I've never said this to anyone. <laughs> the Gemara tells us that Hasidim Harishonim, we're not talking about, you know, after the bench. The Hasidim Harishonim, the Gemara tells us, Harishonim Shah Achas Kodim They would wait and prepare themselves for a full hour before Tfilo. When was this? Hasidim Harishonim in the Gemara's time. And after Tfilo, another hour. And they daven for an hour. How many hours is that? They have a multiplied by three. How many is that? Nine hours. And the Gemara asks, so what? How did they have time for Torah learning? They spent nine hours a day on tefillah. And the Gemara says, Torah misbareches, that there was like a special uh, miracle from heaven that the Torah was, well, was blessed. According to Rav Soledetche, based on the Gemara in Avodah and I encourage all of you to read through this. We don't have time now. You're not allowed to daven except for the framework which one is or attach it. What's the Shachas? And I'd like to suggest the following answer. Rav Soledetche is talking about something called Bakachas Tzrochon. When we ask God for our personal needs, but Tfilah Prayer is much broader than that. His bodedus in Breslau, again, I could be dead wrong about this, but my impression is it's not about Bakosha's Trachov. It's not about, you know, Nebuch, my, my mother is not feeling so well and I want to pray on her behalf. That's Bakosha's Trachov. Feel is much broader than that. When I stand in front of the Ribbon Shalom in his bodedus and I pour out my heart, I'm saying to God, these are my difficulties. These are my pagamim. These are my blemishes. These are my faults. This is where I fell. God, please help me. Give me the guidance. Show me the path, how I can rise, how I can ascend, how I can get closer and closer to you. Those are the essence, the essential points of his bodhis. So it's a personal request, but not necessarily like help send me parnosis, help send me a Right. We're asking for help in help. his karus, his chazkus, to, to get closer to you. It's a way of saying to a father, Dad, we've had some, which I say I don't want to use the word altercations, but we've had some misunderstandings. Usually, we say these words when it's too late. But with our relationship to God, it's never too late. And the Almighty is always there for us. But it's got to be sincere and it's got to be, it's training. It's not something that you, you know, the Israelis talk about bang. You know, it's not spang. It's not, you don't just, you know, snap your fingers and you go into this other this. This is something that you build up as your relationship with the Almighty intensifies. And deepens because you have more challenges. Watch out, please. Doesn't it become repeated that integration into one state in a way that it ceases to have effect as the next one? So that's also something that you have to pour your heart out and ask God to help you. That there should always be his conscious. His conscious means it should always be new. Every day, according to Rabbi Nasan, is an entity that is infinite in time. Every day generates its own obligations. And we wake up in the morning and we accept upon ourselves the obligations of this day. Forget about yesterday. Don't live in the past. Live in the now, in the present. What can I set up as my goal, my schedules, my agenda for this day? What can I achieve? How can I get closer to God? How can I purify myself? How can I remove my pagamim, my blemishes? How can I uplift myself? How can I study God's Torah? One of the greatest supplications that a person should have in his bodhidus is, God, I don't understand your Torah. I've been studying Lakute Alachas, and I don't understand. Help me understand. 
Show me the way. We'll leave, you know, show me the light. What should I be doing with myself? How can I achieve these goals? That's not tzrachav. No, no, no. Tzrachav means when I'm, I, I have something that is in my world, my physical, material world that I'm asking for. You know what I mean? It's parnasa. So parnasa. By the way, la If you have a bakosh for parnasa, you can inject it, and you should inject it into the ninth bracha, which is called berchas hashanim. That's where we ask for rain. So if I'm having trouble with my parnosa, so that's where I'm going to inject that feel of. But finally, and here I think is, again, one of these almost irreconcilable contention, points of contention. I realize it's getting late, so I'm going to try to finish up. I wanted to talk about the unique contribution of Nelson, but more or less, you, you got the point. Subjective emotions. Rav Soloveitchik goes on a tirade. It's almost like enemy number one. And it appears in so many of his essays, his writings, his drushams. Anti-subjective emotionalism. Everything is in the mind, in the intellect. We don't run around with, with, you know, with emotions. That, that, that comes from other sources that are... That are totally foreign to us. And people like Korach and his rebellion, again, now's not the time to go into it, they tried to put the emphasis on the emotions. You know, what do I feel? You know, I put on my tzitzis and I feel, wow, I'm uplifted. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's where it's all at. Not from the perspective of salvation. That's subjectively. All of halacha, ish halacha, is about objectifying. That's why Yishal Lach, Allah, man, is like the mathematician, where everything is objective. And the system of Allah is a brilliantly logical system, self-contained. And yet, in the works of all Hasidism, and especially in the works of Rabbi Nassan, so much emphasis on the way on the feelings, on the emotions, on being uplifted, on being inspired, on simcha, on joy, on feelings of being strengthened, of uplifted, of facing my challenges and discovering Almighty God in His hand as He guides me. I mean, it's all about emotionalism and how to reconcile. And the thought occurred to me, and with this, I'll try to wrap it up because I know the hour is late. I would like to take some questions if possible, if anyone has. There's no question in my mind that these are two worldviews. And to a large extent, in this particular context, to our surprise, Rabbi Yisrael Salanta, I think, is closer to Rabbi Nassim. That may shock you, but that's my opinion. Because if you remember, again, this, six weeks ago, I don't know when we started. It's been a while, so I don't expect you to remember. We spoke about the fact that in Rabbi Yisrael's learning of Musa, it was all about working up a frenzy. It was all about his palus, lehit pa'el. His palus means when I feel lifted and swept away. I over and over again repeat that which is hard for me, that which I'm challenged in terms of my Midos perfection and my self-perfection. All that is foreign to Rav Salvation, and that's why Rav Chaim was initially opposed to the Musa approach. Too much emphasis on subjective emotionalism, this running around and screaming. You remember we told the story about one fellow who realized that he owed my success, he started screaming at himself. You know, that, that's Rabbi Shul's approach. However, what I do believe is that the machlokas here, the contention is not as wide as we think it is. Even Rav Salavage, over and over again in his writings, emphasizes the emotional element. In fact, more than once, I personally heard from him with almost tears in his eyes. 
that he was belying, he was crying over the fact that he has not succeeded in transmitting to his students the emotional experience of a Rosh Hashanah, of a shofar blowing, of a Yom Kippur, of imagining the Kohen Gadol going with Naiba with him. I was unable, he cried, to transmit this to my students. The difference is that from a salivation perspective, the emotionalism has to come at the end of the road. It has to come second in sequence. It's a result of my intellectual understanding of the depths of Torah. If I can appreciate what the avod of the Kohen Gadol is, if I can learn through Masech the Yoma, all the nuances of laws, they're endless, about that one day of the year when the Kohen Gadol goes to fight with him and all the avod he does out. And then I sing Mara Cohen. That emotional frenzy of Mara Cohen is very much appropriate. That's the Kim Shabalev that Rav Salvechik always speaks about. But it has to begin with an objective Misa Mitzvah. I start with an action which can be objectified. I take a lulav, I sit in the sukkah, I eat the matzah, I blow the shofar, and then I trigger off an emotional response that is a result of the Misa, a result of the action. There's no Emotionalism in a subjective sense, health is health. I conclude with the following idea that we have a tremendous opportunity to learn the Torah, the ethical teachings of these three giants, and to see how close they are one to the other. And Aaron pointed out very beautifully to me, I mean, what may we call other? That we can really learn from all, each one in his own unique way contributes. Rav Salvechik will give us more of the contemporary, and Rav Yisrael will give us more of the self-analysis and Midos perfection program, and Rav Nassim will give us the entire gamut of how to serve Hashem, you feel close to Hashem, and constantly be focused on God and getting close to God. And if we integrate all these three elements, we can create what I think is a beautiful, beautiful society, a community that would be with shame with the Ferris Yisrael in your Amen. Thank you very much. Anyone has questions, and also from the Zoom, uh, you, I think you could unmute yourself and uh, uh, yeah, Rob to on. Add something to a uh, question? Okay. Rob on. Hi. Yes, hi. Um, you were, you mentioned Rob Nathan. And almost as if these ideas were his, but wasn't he simply transmitting uh, Ravi Nachman's uh, ideas? Excellent, excellent question, Chaim. I'll answer that question to the best of my knowledge. I'm very new. Ravi Nassan is a world, a world of knowledge. It's mind-boggling. Eight volumes of Lakute Allah. You can spend an hour on one single paragraph amongst eight volumes. And I'm not underestimating besides so many of his other works. He died at the age of 64. It's mind-boggling to imagine how one man in a lifetime could have achieved so much. Last night I was at a, what they call a hilula, you know, when we celebrate a yard site. At the yard site that I went to, there were many all over the country for Rabbi Nassan. But one of the speakers spoke about the suffering of the man if you read his biography, he went through such tremendous anguish. His family opposed him, his own wife opposed him, his father-in-law, his father. At the end, they, they trumped up a libel against, they threw him into the worst dungeon and they, they, they tortured him, right? terrible. And he always took it with a, with a bright smile. It's an unbelievable person. I started crying when I heard the stories. Now you're asking me, is it all Rabbi Nachman? And I'll tell you what I honestly think. I can't tell you percentage-wise, but I have no doubt that Rabbi Nachman adds his own chidush. At every section, he writes which Torah, which number in the simonim of Rabbi Nachman he's building himself on. But you go back and you read Rabbi Nachman, and you ask yourself, where did Rabbi Nachman see all these worlds that are so embellished? in the very short paragraph of the doctrine. 
So you have to judge for yourself whether it's just that he's giving over transmitting Rav Nachman's Torah or it's his own Torah. I have a feeling that the PhD thesis has not yet been written to answer your question. <laughs> and it's a lot more of a Chiddush of Nasa than we, than we are trained to believe. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so I'll take this opportunity again to thank Aaron and Mike for all the work that they put in on a volunteer basis. It's the shame to Ferris. And to all of you for coming. It's been a great experience for me. Very challenging. It's the first time around that I've spoken on this top greatest series, especially in the last piece, to sort of integrate all of it together and try to imagine what a community might be like if it's built on the foundations of these three giants and their contributions. So it should be Zohar Hashem following Asar Beteves to see, instead of the Churban Chas Shalom, because Chazal say any generation where the base on which wasn't built is as if they saw the Churban in front of their eyes, we should be Zohar Hashem to see and witness the Geula Shlema, the ultimate redemption and Mashiach, Tzimkenu B'meir Amen. Thank you, sir.